Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely awesome talk with Georgetown's Mike Hill discussing the role of mentorship in strength and conditioning. Uh, we're going to get into a quick intro, and then Mike's going to get right into, you know, how he got to Georgetown and how he was taught and brought up and, and learned the ropes through Augie Morelli, and how he's now trying to relay and reteach and, and mentor his staff in a similar fashion in order to keep this Iron Hoya brand or Iron Hoya family continuing um, as careers develop. Uh, you know, we get through all that. And we also, you know, if you're talking about Georgetown, you got to talk a little basketball, right? And we talk about how administration and coaching staffs have impacted him, both coaching wise and as a mentor in his tenure at Georgetown. Uh, you know, guys, this is really an awesome talk. And hearing Mike break all this down and go from the the mentee to the mentor is really fascinating stuff to me. And I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Coach, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Hey, no problem, Coach. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. This is this is one I'm really excited because there aren't many people who have been able to, you know, at least set, you know, lawn-like roots in a spot. And we've both had similar tenures in our locations. So how about we give, you know, the people here the, the brief intro, the quick rundown as to who Mike is and how we got up there to, to, to Hoya land and, and everything in between. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, no, it's a pleasure to be on your show. I mean, I've been there, been here since 2004. We were just talking about that 16 years, man. It's been, it's been a journey, you know? Um, and I guess, uh, you know, speaking about how I got here, that's probably a podcast in itself. We were just talking about that. Um, and so, Basically, it was just, you know, Coach Augie Morelli taking taking a chance on a young strength coach. And so, uh, you know, when I called him back in, you know, 2004 in the summertime and I and uh, 
you know, he, he, he called me back and I picked up the phone and it was a great relationship ever since, you know, um, now with that tutelage with him and me being here for 15 years, I guess, uh, and not going too much into, to, you know, how the, the road to my success or, or path here. Um, but now that's kind of what I want to give back. And so, you know, I've been very fortunate to work for Coach Morelli, have colleagues like Carl Johnson, Sean Foster, Cam Williams, um, John Shackleton at Villanova. There's Trevor Williams, Craig Mazuski. There's so many people that have come through Georgetown is, is I want to pass that along. If I were to leave tomorrow, then who's going to take it over? Who's going to continue with that? sort of linear progression, you know, what we were talking about and not have it be, be a huge back offset and, and have a re- hit the reset button. Cause I feel like we are doing some good things here, you know, being here for that 14, 15 year period, I would like to think that uh, we've put Georgetown on a path to success. And so coach Dave Terry is now here. And so he's kind of, you know, I, I don't want to think of him as, as uh, somebody who's who works underneath me, I, I think more across the line is somebody who works with me. And so I'm trying to teach him all the little things that Coach Morelli had taught me early on and uh, kind of a, you know, a big brother, maybe a mentor, maybe a director. And so, you know, I w- wear a lot of different hats with him, but also – I want him to learn that history and that knowledge to take it forward if I were to leave. And if he was the one, and if he is the one, then the next person behind him, he can do the same thing. So that's what Augie did to me. I mean, he he was very, at the beginning, um, you know, open on a lot of things, but he also, there was some tough love. There was some tough love there. And I remember the day Augie finally sat me down in a meeting and he was like, Hill, you get it. You You get it. You get everything. Um, you're going to be a great head strength coach. And it just so happens when he left to go to Delaware, I was the one who, who took on, uh, his position. And so I I have been very fortunate, very fortunate with that. I love that. And I love the idea of giving back within your staff and building that camaraderie and that apprenticeship or like jokingly, how we said before, like that Padawan, the Jedi master, like step by step. (laughs) So yeah. can you dive down that rabbit hole a little more? Like, can you give a few examples of what Augie did for you that you turned around and almost been like, oh, like almost like you've caught yourself when you've done it. You've been like, oh, or, I remember when Augie did that. Or like things that have been kind of planted that you've sort of mapped out step by step for your staff in order to ensure things keep moving in a positive direction? I guess it's not there. I don't know if there's one thing, I guess more along the lines when the, and Dave gets really upset. I shouldn't say upset, but he's, he's definitely aware of it. If you were to talk to him um, and the rest of my staff, you know, when a situation comes up, I like to basically hit the pause button on that situation and explain maybe a little bit of history at that point in time. Um, if something, you know, were, let's say, for example, a, a coach um, has, a, a, you know, a problem or a situation with something that, uh, you know, they're doing in the weight room or there's a meeting going to happen or a uh, an athlete has done something. And so I press the pause button with it, Dave, or with it, Miguel, Christina, and we have an army of interns here. Um, so when that pops up, I just you know, say, Hey, I remember when this happened, this is how Augie dealt with it. Um, this happened before with me, this is how I've dealt with it. This is my advice. And, you know, actually speaking with Todd Hammer a long time ago, he said, we do a good job of letting coaches grow organically. And so I, I, that really hit home for me. Um, I think we really do. We give them parameters, um, and guidelines. So, you know, I give that history of, what had happened in the past with myself and coach Augie Morelli, I give my advice of what I think should happen. And then that coach can take their route. Um, You know, uh, Augie said, he told me one time that, uh, you know, if I, if he ends up in a meeting about my actions, then he is the head strength coach. I am no longer the head strength coach. So that was my rule with all the teams. You know, if he ended up with women's basketball or women's across or a certain team, if he ended up in a meeting with the head coach, 
and the head coach was not looking at me, he was looking at Augie, then Augie's now should be the one dictating the program. That's kind of the ownership that he wanted to give me. Um, you know, I guess it comes up a lot where, you know, I'll tell Dave, I'll sit back and say, you know, Augie would have done this or he, this is how he would have done it. This is how I would do it. And Dave, I think Dave gets a little tired of that, but I always tell him, you know, in five years, you're going to be that guy sitting in that chair telling the next coach, uh, telling the next coach about your, how Mike always talked about Augie and whatnot. And I, and I like to think it's a uh, passing of the torch ish. So if that was a roundabout way of kind of answering that. Diving no, a hundred percent. Yeah. hundred. And if you want to run down that rabbit hole even more, that's great. Cause I mean, like we were talking about before, like I think Augie is like, He's one of the gems of, of our profession. So like yeah. to hear kind of how it's passing message. down. Yeah, I was on a text message uh, uh, chain with uh, Coach Carl Johnson, um, Eric Sianu at the Bills, um, and then uh, Craig Fitzgerald, who is now at Tennessee. And uh, Craig kind of said, was like, Augie, we need you back, basically telling him that you need to come back. And, you know, for me, he was – Augie was uh, – you know, I never had a big brother, and so he was obviously a perfect marriage, and he was kind of like the Yoda uh, of uh, of my strength and conditioning um, knowledge philosophy. And, you know, everything that when I was learning, the first question I actually asked him was, you know, learning all the programming, all the science behind it and numbers and things. I was like, you know, what are you doing with your percentages? How are you creating your programs? And he basically stopped me in my tracks, like, what are you talking about? You know, we just, uh, not saying he did a Bulgarian style, just grip and rip, but that's basically what he was doing, um, you know, and loading up the bar. And he was a master motivator and he would get kids to move. And the funny thing is, he is super smart. And, uh, you know, he worked on Wall Street, went to Johns Hopkins, double major, and he is very smart. So he knows all the science. He knows all that stuff. He trained with Bill Starr. He's in the book. Um, only a strong shell survives. So he knows all that stuff. And if this guy is telling you, just load the bar up, you load the bar up. Um, so, uh, I, you know, teaching all those little stories and, um, you know, how I kind of, you know, he was, he, he paved the road here, really. There was no other strength coach here at Georgetown besides him. When I came here, it was Coach Morelli lifting on the second floor of McDonough, the building next to us. And, uh, there was another guy who was helping out. His name was Harrison Bernstein. Very smart. You know, I learned a lot of speed and agility stuff stuff from him. And uh, we had two work study people. And then it was myself working for free. And so we built, well, Augie built that program or this program, the Iron Hoyas. And uh, now we have three full-time, one part-time. And now we have uh, four professional internships um, that we pay stipends and we give them outside employment. So it, it's it's working very well. Um, and looking back 14 years till now, um, I would like to think that Augie would be proud of us. Just like if I leave, I would like to think I would be proud of Dave and the next person and the next person. So, um, yeah. Well, and then I think another thing that's always interesting with coaches is, is transition within the athletic department. And mm -hmm. yeah. you know, you've had two pretty high profile changes while you've been there. How, yeah. how have those changes impacted the weight room? How have those changes impacted Mike Hill and his role within the department and how he handles those, those teams? I guess. Uh, so when I first came here, they were in a transition of the athletic director. And so Adam Brick was our interim um, athletic director. And then they ended up hiring Bernard Muir, um, who is now at Stanford University, um, and then went through uh, another little transition period between that and ended up hiring Lee Reed. Um, and I can say this, that uh, Augie working here uh, for Bernard, and then he went up to Delaware. Those two guys, I couldn't have asked for better athletic directors to work under. Lee Reed will actually, you know, if I get a problem with something, I can just text him, call him up. We have a great working relationship. Um, you know, I know Bob, Bob Alejo, you had him on on uh, on the podcast and talking about somebody having direct connection with that. And so I'm very fortunate to have that here. Um, and that's a that's a major strength for us. So working with Lee has been been a blessing. Um, but on the back end, I guess. 
with uh, with Coach Thompson. I mean, that's maybe a longer podcast too. But uh, you know, me coming here in 2004, he played a major part in that because what Augie had told me was really basketball didn't have a strength coach, and if I wanted to be that, I could pave my way to that position. And uh, working, you know, I, I, when I was younger, I was uh, grew up in I'm from originally from Iowa, but Uh, My parents brought me here in like 1985, 86, and I had a Georgetown t-shirt and a Georgetown pair of shorts. So for me, being back in Iowa, having just Iowa State gear and being an Iowa State fan, I love them. They're at the the top. But I also had Georgetown basketball uh, kind of roots planted in that shirt and those shorts because that was very important to me as as a young kid. And so I was always following them. So it it was very strange um, that I had a love being from Iowa for this program. And so I came here with the intent of being at this position when I got, when I was, when I was coming here. Um, so working for coach Thompson, I mean, he was probably, there's only a handful of people who I could work for within the country, within, you know, you know, basketball and then, and the coaches and, and, uh, there, there's a lot of craziness out there and a lot of disloyalty and a lot of, uh, dictators rather than, I shouldn't call them CEOs, but uh, head coaches and just genuine people who care about their staff, compare about the athletes. Um, and not, I'm not naming, naming any names, but Coach Thompson was one of the top for me. And he basically, I remember coming to, to him too with, uh, with, with uh, you know, tons of programming. I had a whole PowerPoint presentation. I sat down with him at the first meeting and uh, he was like, Mike, I know you brought all that stuff with you, but uh, I just want – you need to know this is my direction of the program. Um, I know that you are loyal. I'm going to be loyal to you. I want you to be honest with me. I'm going to give you same thing, kind of the parameters of this is what I want. This is, uh, you know, my advice, but I'm not going to dictate your program. So uh, I shouldn't say he was not hands off by any means, um, but he did ask questions and he wanted to know, but he let me do my job. He empowered me to do my job. Um, I, I don't. I don't know if the term decentralized command would be a good term to use, but he kind of, he, he basically gave me that uh, power to whatever I needed. And, and if I needed something, um, needed help with anything, it was always, boom, it's done. Um, and he's just like Lee. He was one phone call away. So uh, it's just basically just calling him up if I needed something or shooting him a text message. And, and, uh, and it, it's crazy because he's, he's a great coach. He ran a great program and he's a good person. Like he is a really good person and he's a friend. And so I'm very fortunate, you know, very fortunate with that. And, uh, you know, now with uh, turning over to Coach Ewing, um, when I first, obviously, you know, I said in 1985-ish, you know, that's when Coach Ewing uh, was here and obviously left and went to the New York Knicks. So he was kind of, you know, this, this legend that I had. Uh, put up here. And so when I first came here, um, you you understand the history of Coach Ewing. You understand Coach Thompson's history. Um, and you move on down to those players that everyone always names, uh, Dikembe and Alonzo and Allen Iverson and such and Otto Porter and Jeff Green, stuff like that. But little Patrick Ewing transferred here from Indiana, and I'm probably going to get the, the year wrong, 2006, maybe 2007, right? Right around in there. And so um, just meeting him when Coach Ewing had come back for different things, just kind of informally and whatnot, but knowing his son and training his son, um, and then his son became a member of the staff with, uh, at, the, at the end of Coach Thompson's tenure, um, it was an e- I shouldn't say it was an easy transition, but Coach is kind of the same way. You know, He's empowering me to do the things that I need to do while still asking questions and still giving me kind of parameters and things. And, and uh, you know, we had a discussion on how he wanted to play and how he wanted the guys to move and his, you know, his philosophies. And you're talking about a guy who was a legend at his position and he is emulates pretty much. I, I shouldn't say the same things as what Coach Thompson does, but he's unbelievably loyal. He's a great mentor. He's a great friend, a good person outside of the basketball court um, and a great person inside. You know, it, it's it's both. So. It's I have been very blessed, you know, to when I got here, I had Coach Morelli um, to working for many coaches who who have come along uh, the Georgetown Athletics uh, program. But um, 
you know, Coach Thompson and then Coach Ewing. And then also kind of, it's not meant, I, 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 don't, I guess I don't mention enough, is, you know, Big Coach and Miss Michael, um, who were here for, for a very long time, um, just listening and learning from them and, and not asking too many questions and just kind of leading by, you know, their example of, you know, how they wanted this place to run, you know, like good big coach always says Georgetown was built on, you know, good human resources. So we didn't have a whole lot of facilities until this facility was built two years ago. And so they had to have good human resources to compete with everybody else. Um, so now when you say big coach, you're talking about big John. Yes. Yes. How much do you think, because obviously he had an, immense impact on both of them how much do you think his impact is still there in the coaching tree and how much do you think the groundwork that he laid in the 80s by you know being able to bring those student athletes in that were so dominant I mean that for all intents and purposes Big John changed the Big East yeah um yeah. how much do you feel like 20 years later that still resonates and and what are some things that you see like with the history as a upstate New York guy um, from really close to that place where he yelled and Manly Fieldhouse is officially closed um, how much power is the name Big John still with everything there what I mean I, I guess you know, obviously the building was named after him. So, so the there's that <laughs> right, right now. So he had an immense impact on the school as not only athletic department, but as an educational system. And it's always reminded, you know, the guys uh, that he brought in, they went to class. Um, they did their work. Uh, you know, he, he still talks about it as this is an academic institution. Um, the kids now still, they have to go to class and not naming names, but there is other places where you don't, I mean, it's just the reality of the situation, but you know, that's kind of my, I guess leading, bleeding into my philosophy too, is my, my mom was a teacher for 40 plus years. And so that's, it's a perfect kind of spot for me with big coach is that that's what he believed in was teaching at all the time, at all aspects. Like, you know, if there's something on the floor, um, you know, a bottle or something, pick it up. You know, if there is a situation going on, you know, you shake the person's hand, you look them in the eye and you talk to them and you're honest. I think, you know, big coach laid the groundwork on many aspects, not just basketball. You know, it, it's, and, and I guess, uh, you know, everyone talks about the Hoya paranoia, and uh, what that was and what, you know, the, what that sense was from the outside looking in. But me being here since 2004 and uh, now being on the inside, like, I get it. I get, you know, the reasons why that he wanted it that way. And I, I wouldn't say that that's still, you know, kind of emulating through, but I, I just, I think, you have to be aware of the history of, of he, he put us on the map. He put Georgetown on the map. And so, you know, with Coach Thompson and now Coach Ewing, and then if some were to come along the lines, you know, down the line, that, you know, 10 years from now or whatnot, if it's somebody from outside the Georgetown tree, they're still going to have to carry that history with them. So, um, it, you know, it, I guess it's, it, it's, it is what it is. You know, it, it's, uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be here without big coach, you know, um, and, uh, you know, just his, uh, his mentorship and just, just an unintended mentorship, just, just stuff that I've watched and learned and listened and heard, you know, telling stories and things. It's, it's, it's been great. And, uh, yeah, I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change anything, anything in my path. It's, it's been, it's been wonderful. I love it. It's, I'll never look at another coach that has a towel on the bench the same way that I looked at, you know, coach Thompson with, with his tenure there. And it's, uh, yeah. I mean, if you, it's funny, the few people that have come to Georgetown, 
Like when I first came to Georgetown, and we can talk about this now because obviously we have a new facility, but not many people came to Georgetown. When I came here, it was, uh, or not many people who have talked about Georgetown have actually come here. So when you come here and actually see what Coach Thompson had and competing with other schools and other big time schools, you know, that have huge facilities, that have chefs, that have all these things, dorms, great looking dorms, looking dorms. And uh, you see what Coach Thompson was able to do just on, you know, being honest and being firm and running a great program. And you would respect him a hundred thousand times more. So that's kind of, uh, I guess, a little, you know, I guess snippet for me, it was, it was very eye opening. I'm like, holy shit. This is what coach did with this. Um, you know, our weight room was very small. It was so small that we couldn't do anything overhead. It was seven feet five um, because Roy Hibbert barely touched his, his head on the, on, on the weight room. So the weight room ceiling. So it's very small. There was three stages to it too. And that helped make me a better coach that helped me, me, um, learn how to get kids to buy into the program. Um, you know, when recruits would come in and they come in and see Georgetown and then they go and go to another school, not naming any names, they go to another school after us. I mean, it's, you know, if the kid is just being wooed and wowed, of course they're going to end up going somewhere. Um, but like Co big coach said, we were built on good human resources and you get guys like, you know, look at our lineage and how many people we put in the NBA. I mean, we're not really, we're, we're, I guess, how do I word this? We're, you know, we're training athletes, um, but we're also making men, if that makes any sense. A hundred percent. And then continuing along that, that's three extremely different styles of play from Big John yes. to JT3 and now to Patrick Ewan. Yes. Um, who people really could say, next to Big John, had the biggest impact on Georgetown basketball's history, was getting Ewing. Um, but how <laughs> has that, as a strength and conditioning coach, those you know, 270-degree turns... How has that impacted you? How has that made you a better coach? And how has that made you take a step back and reevaluate what you're doing? So I guess, you know, talking about your big coach's style, um, you know, press off or press uh, defense and, you know, kind of in your face, that bulldog uh, style of not backing down. Um, and then, you know, Coach Thompson with the, with the we call it, everybody called it the Princeton offense, which I mean, they called it a Georgetown offense. You know, yeah, with they call the, it the Richmond offense. Yeah, it's all the Richmond same thing. Offense, yeah. And, uh, and there's, it's funny, you know, you get to the NBA and, uh, you have to know that stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fact. You have to know how to play with each other. And if the guy dribbles that you got to know your options and things. And so, you know, which also coach Thompson had an open style and no one ever talked about that. And he, but it, so I guess with that and now with coach Ewing, um, bringing in the more, uh, you know, I don't, I, for each one of them, I don't want to label that. These are just, I guess my words, not, you know, how their words with, but with coach Ewing bringing a more NBA type of style and a faster pace. Um, I guess, you know, I never worked directly for, for big coach. I worked obviously John and, uh, um, coach Ewing. So, um, with those, um, I guess it's more, I'm, each one of them and just being at this place and being around this program and what I was saying about my mom being a teacher, I guess my theories and thoughts have gone from this super huge technical program to the daily, you know, daily changes and implementations. And like I was saying about coach Terry and putting the pause button, teaching them some history and be, being more of a teacher rather than a le like lecturing at kids and making them conform to my style. I'm kind of conforming to each one of their styles. Um, I guess, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, basketball coaches and, uh, you know, is their, is their style of play dictated within the weight room or within that conditioning session and, and that stuff. Yes, there's little things and verbiage and all that stuff's important in your 
grand scheme of things, when you're taking that information in and plugging it into your own head and your own, you know, algorithmic binary code, and then spitting out whatever program you have, I think it's all important. But to say that we're lifting in here, like Coach Ewing is playing out there, it just from it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I'm aware of it. Um, we do things that are tailored towards a faster pace in terms of uh, when we do our speed and agility sessions and you know conditioning. Um, there's certain things coach wants them to do, doesn't want them to do. Um, hey, he wants to help them out. The verbiage that they're using, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I mean, training's training. It's it's not uh, – when Coach Thompson was here, we weren't mirroring the Princeton offense in inside the weight room. It was more of uh, uh, kind of his, uh, I guess, the back-end things of, you know, does he want him to wear this stuff? Does he want him to be respectful to each other? Stuff like that. Those things are more important than his style of play, if that if that kind of makes sense for that question. No, 100%. And I – and I guess that I kind of look at some of the things with, with kind of how you were saying it, that like breaking down the, the movement actions, I think, of the, the Princeton offense and, excuse me, of the offense, you shouldn't give it a location, right? Um, we, uh, you know, teaching them how to move more proficiently in those manners yeah. with cuts and how they change direction and, and those things. But And we did do that. Yeah, and we did do that stuff. Yep, we did do we mirrored cuts and you know, um, you know, like Princeton offense, you know, like is uh, the choppy feet principle. You no, know, you don't know why it works, but when you choppy feet and make some noise, you know, it kind of startles the person in front of you when you're doing a, a, a mirroring. Um, yeah, we could talk about that for hours. We could talk about that, you know. <laughs> but it gets around like you know uh, those little things, um, you know. Uh, I've said this a long time ago, but my program it, or everybody's you know strength program is you know a third of uh, you know what you want to do. It's a third of what the coaches want to see, and it's a third of what the players actually want to do. So you're looking at that, and you're like, oh, we're going to do some explosive movements and some you know bilateral uh, let, uh, hip hinge, whatever you're doing for that day. And then the kids just they just want to bench and they want to do curls and stuff like that. But the coaches also want to see sport specific, you know, basketball movements and slams and rips and stuff like that and getting around screens. So you have to have all of those. So it's a, it's a triangle, really. It's a triangle of what you want, what the kids want, what the coaches want and what you want. And you have to mirror that in different ways and how that moves through that system. And, uh, that's probably a yeah, whole nother, whole nother podcast of how you do that. I don't know if you can see behind me. This is, uh, this is my monthly board. I PR'd on boards this summer. So I have, a I have a, <laughs> I wish you could see, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll pull this in, but this is, excuse me for this, but yeah, this is my yearly board. So this is what, you know, instead of putting an Excel format sheet, I basically just put this up on the board for the guys to know where they are. So we're here at Monday, so just like at the mall, you know where you're at. You're right here. Um, and so guys can come up here, cross it off. They can see where we're at. Um, you know, I could have it in some great technology, on put it up on the board. But uh, I just decided, you know, they, they see the whiteboards all the time. They are, they're always, you know, uh, looking at that with, with all my programs. And so I got my yearly board right here. I got my monthly board, which switches up where you can see this is the week that we're right here. Um, the tabs that we move, because a lot of things move, and then we have to manipulate some things. And so are we doing conditioning today? Are we doing lifting? And I have it all set up in, a, in an Excel format. But as you know, basketball changes. It's up and down and left and right. And uh, my weekly board is over here, and then I have my professional uh, goals and things. But I have my daily board outside. Um, and then I'm pretty, pretty sure everybody does the quote of the day, which is everything – I base my workouts kind of in my my stuff that I'm going to teach the kids for today, kind of like my lesson plans on my uh, on my uh, quote of the day and my daily board. So, um, yeah, that's what is that seven seven whiteboards? It's pretty intense. I dig it though, man. I love it. I, I mean, love I feel it. like after a while, I just you know I had one board with my daily workouts. I put that up on the board, but for me to organize my own thoughts. You know, everybody uses Excel or if they're using some other type of technology, um, you're using that. But I liked to see it every day and be visual with it. 
And, uh, you know, whether it's this board right up here, I mean, this is what we're trying to get to, obviously, is in, in the championship right here. Those kids need to see that. Those kids don't understand, like, hey, we just went through a 10 week summer, right? So then you have three weeks off or whatever you have. And then we have another 10 weeks until we literally play a scrimmage. So some of the kids who don't really like to what the word is now is trust the process. Some kids who don't believe in the process, you know, you got to show them that and maybe, you know, that'll change their perspective. Show them the month. You know, this is what we have for this month. Show them the weekly plan that you're looking at um, and then show them the daily stuff and just be honest and upfront with them um, because that's what, you know, as a, a – call myself in another podcast I called myself a life coach but um that's what we, we were teachers teachers life coaches mentors friends and everything and and within that I think is you know strength and conditioning coach changed to sports performance changed probably to high performance now I don't know what they're calling that calling us now but uh um yeah it's a teacher mentor uh coach type of a job now so you know I I really like to be visual with that and see it every day and let the athletes see it I love so. it. I love it. Especially if it helps them understand and buy in and be more involved. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they can, uh, they can see it and let them cross it off. And, you know, I, uh, I also, I have a report on my other board. So I ask four questions every, every day and it's, uh, they have to weigh themselves in and write their body weight up there. Um, how many hours they sleep and, uh, how they feel Hoya scale one to five. And then, uh, they get a plus minus or a zero for breakfast, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So a plus if they ate, minus if they didn't, a zero if it didn't happen. So I asked those four questions. I make them put them up there. And then you can, through those questions, those those four things from them, you can start conversations with them. And, you know, and if they get into a rhythm of doing that every day and kids, you know, giving positive or negative feedback on that, if they get in a red, rhythm of doing that, it just opens up those lines of communication that, you know, technology – and, you know, uh, other coaches and people are trying to get to, if you just talk to the kids, I mean, th that's the best, the best form of technology is just communication, really human to human. No doubt. Because at the end of the day, if you're not having those conversations and you're not getting anything to drive everything forward, you're just wasting your time. Yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah. Well, listen, Mike, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us today. This is absolutely fantastic stuff, man. No, thank you for having me. I, you know, this, uh, this, a, it, you know, you unbelievable work that you do. And then I listen to your podcast. And so I'm very, uh, humbled that I am now number 152, number 152. And you have had, uh, a slew of people who, I mean, I have listened to and, uh, who are one, using the term indirect mentor, but you know, different people throughout and you've had them and you've talked to them and, and that's salute to you and the work that you've done and how long you've stayed at uh, university of Richmond and all the great stuff that you're doing. And it's, it's sad that I guess the sad part is we haven't, we haven't talked, uh, you know, enough and we haven't, uh, I guess played each other enough and been down up and down, but it's, I mean, you know, I, I know how schedules go and crazy things and the light, the, the, uh, schedule of, uh, uh, of a, uh, strength coach is, is, uh, very demanding. So, um, yeah, I wish we could do this more often. Well, yeah, dude, totally. And we definitely will be able to up there at, in the end of November, early December. Yep. Yep. Is it now, is that on campus or is that at the Verizon center? Uh, to be honest, I have not plugged in the schedule, our yeah. schedule yet. Tomorrow we start the first day of practice. So that's normally when I put, I don't, I, this is my own head. I don't, I don't look at the schedule until the first day of practice. And so I, I, I just kind of, um, you know, it's kind of waves when it comes in, when the schedule comes in. And so for me, I don't want to know it until that first day. And I don't so blame you. I, I've <laughs> looked, but it's the same, you know, I, I shouldn't say it's the same every year, but you know, I'm getting these guys kind of mentally prepared on this. And then, you know, once that first day you know, practice starts, you know, we post it up there on the board and this is what we have. And it kind of rejuvenates the, the relearning process, um, of our program. So it just, yeah, kind of crazy. Train thing that... for the next box to check and then train for the next box to check after that. I love it, man. Yeah. Well, yeah, Mike, man. Well, totally, man. This is awesome. I can't thank you enough for the time. And uh, this is great. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And uh, listen, man, we'll see you up in D.C. here in a little over a month. But uh, thank you so much. And we'll be in touch real soon.
All right, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. And a huge thank you to Georgetown's Mike Hill for spending the time with us today. Guys, it's just understanding your role when it comes to developing the next generation of coaches and really taking to heart the people that have been there to help develop you is really awesome. And hearing it firsthand with how Mike has gone from mentee to mentor is just fascinating stuff. And then hearing how you know, surviving different uh, coaching and administration changes it has really helped mold him and, and bring about this this idea even further it is just fascinating. I can't thank Mike enough for spending the time with us today. This is really sensational. And guys, as always, if you did enjoy it, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, guys, we are just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we possibly can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.